So, our speakers this afternoon um, are Helena Moore from the Bromford Group, and um, she, I'll say a little bit more about her in a second, but um, she's going to talk to us about her experiences there. And then she's going to be followed by Lucy Ventrice, who um, is Talent and Capability Manager for EasyJet, um, a name you all probably recognise. Um, and you'll be surprised, I think, at some of the kind of challenges that, that Lucy has to face in terms of getting learning to people in all sorts of strange places and, and with weird workflows and so on. So that's what's on, on tap for this afternoon. I'm looking forward to a really entertaining session. Just very quickly before we kick off, you know where the fire exits are, just clock where they are before we kick off, just in case. And without further ado, Helena, would you like to start us off? Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, I, uh, I want, I'm going to share the Bromford story with you, and um, it's going to be one of those stories that's uh, it's about a journey, and it's a journey with a number of bumps on it. So, because the reality of it is, no matter how much theory we can talk about learning and development, uh, you never have a blank sheet of paper to start off with, do you? So, uh, so this is going to be a story very much that shares with you our bumps as well, and how we've uh, swerved around them, bumped over them, and, and dealt with those. Um, I also thought I'd take the opportunity, um, whilst I was up here, to uh, share with you that I uh, actually have another little business on the side, and that is rentabridesmaid.com. And uh, if those of you saw me just earlier on assisting Lucy with her outfit and the microphone, you'll see that I'm very professional at uh, Rent a Bridesmaid. I can uh, dance with anyone. I will get drunk, fall over under a table, lose a shoe, cry at the end of the night. And, uh, um, but I do feel very much today like I, I'm not sure which hat I've got on. Am I the bridesmaid today because I'm the warmer pack for Lucy and I've been assisting her? Or, or am I here with my Bromford hat on? But I think I'm, I'm pretty clear that it is the Bromford hat. So uh, enough about that, but I'll, I'll give you my details later. Later, should you should you want to book me for for any up-and-coming weddings um, that you might have okay so because we're not a household name like EasyJet I thought I'd better give you some of our vital statistics um, and that is who we are we're, we're a social business and you might kind of uh, want to call us the housing association because that's generally what we've been called in the past um, but we're a bit more than that now We've got 27,500 homes. Um, we provide support services to around 9,500 people. Some of them live in our homes, some of them live in other people's homes. Those support services could be to anybody with an acquired brain injury, an injury mental health problem, teenage family, um, or a, uh, a whole range of vulnerabilities that people might have. And as well as that, we provide support with helping people get into education, volunteering, um, and employment opportunities as well. So, so much more than, than we used to be when we were simply a housing association. And we've got about 1,250 colleagues. Um, those 1,250 colleagues are based over about 90 different sites. So just to give you an idea of how dispersed we are, loosely across central England, but that's, uh, that is a very loose term. And the types of colleagues we have are from right down from the chief executive level to our engineers and our, our support workers that are providing a service on the, on the front line. So, when it came to learning, um, we decided a couple of years back we wanted to get our colleagues to put some 3D glasses on and think about learning and what they actually deliver day in, day out with, uh, through a, a, a 3D perspective, really. And that's what we've been aiming at on this journey, on this journey ever since. So that was our, our holy grail, was to get people to think in a 3D way. And that was what people are actually doing why they're actually doing it, and also how they're actually doing it. So our approach to learning hasn't just been about the delivery or the learning itself. It's very much that 3D, that whole 3D approach. So to tell you the story of part of that, I'm going to do that through the lens of our, our learning management um, and our performance management system, which is, which is one and the same. And it's what we call B Bromford. B Bromford is our learning and performance space. What I want to make it very clear here is that B. Bromford has not been the driver, this system has not been the driver of what we, what we wanted to achieve and what we have achieved. It's very much been there to support our journey. So what we've done is we've evolved it, we've nurtured it, we've changed it, um, and we've made that very much support us on our journey rather than drive that journey for us. And that's been the beauty of the B. Bromford product that we, that we have. So let me tell you a little bit more um, about how we use it. 
So B Bromford has within it our performance management and our learning, our learning content as well. So just get started into, into the what. So how do, we, how do we really get clear with people what it is we want them to deliver in the business? And we do that in B Bromford very much through our smart targets. This is the really quick bit and the dead easy bit. Because our smart targets, we set them up simply on the system. So they're just a, something that people put in and then we can monitor them, it sends us alerts, etc. And, and uh, they cascade right down from the overall strategic plan. We then have our team plans and then that's translated into the team, into smart targets. The biggest challenge for this one is getting our colleagues to think about how to create really, uh, really effective smart targets and really um, concise ones. But, but that's the what and it's quite simple but it works very, very well for us as long as it has that golden thread right back to the strategic plan. So onto the more meaty stuff, and that's the, that's the how. Well, in B Bromford, we have a learning section that very much supports us on the how we want people to deliver what we want them to do. All of our colleagues have a job profile, and from the job profile, we create a job-ready pathway. Um, we, I say we have a job-ready pathway for every job. That's a slight exaggeration. It's a bit like the fourth bridge, because by the time you finish one, it's either changed or we've got another job coming on board. So it's definitely a work in progress. But we've created job-ready pathways, particularly for the key roles in the business. And it's those pathways that colleagues work through using the B Bromford system to support them um, in that blended piece of learning. So it might be that it's used as a booking place for them to book on workshops. It might be that they actually do e-learning in there. It might be that they actually do a piece of self-learning in there, but it tracks that they are becoming job ready. Um, my favorite bit of, uh, of the job ready pathways is the running man who will run along to whatever percentage that people are uh, job ready. I'm very easily pleased with a bit of gamification, which is, which is great and colleagues love it too. Um, and what that helps us to do, though, is report back, particularly to our board. Our board set us a challenge a couple of years ago, and they said they wanted to know just how job ready is this business. And now we can start to give them some much clearer answers on what percentage of colleagues are fully job ready, what percentage of colleagues are at 80% or where we've got learning gaps that we need to plug. So this has given us a whole range of reporting data now that we can um, not only uh, decide what we design and what we deliver next, but it's also helped us to, um, to be able to report on the effectiveness of the learning that we're delivering. Okay, and all of that is backed up by our very newest baby, um, our very newest part of the, the B Bromford system, which is our social learning community. So some of the learning that goes into that, it might be a workshop, it might be an online piece of learning, will have behind it the social learning community. And that's the bit where we get colleagues to bring it alive in the business. So they will tell the stories of how they're delivering that. They will add their own experiences to the learning. They might post articles on there. Um, but that's where we will share how they're actually delivering the learning, particularly when it's in test phase. And that's given us a lot of data on how we can improve the training um, that, we, that we're delivering. So that's our, our, the newest part of the B, the B Bromford story. But as well as giving people the skills um, and the right tools to do the job, we're also really, really passionate about how they actually deliver things as well. So it's what attitude do they bring with, with them when they're delivering that. And there's a little bit of a story behind this that, that I want to share with you. We were 50 last year. That's Bromford, not me. Can I just make that clear? Um, and in our 50th year, you know, most people, apparently men all buy a Harley Davidson. I don't know whether that's true. And women have a horse. So uh, I don't know whether that's true either. But what we did is we decided to have a bit of self-reflection. And we noticed there was a bit of an illness going on in the business. And there was something that we'd spotted called the VVM sweats. And the VVM sweats were the vision, value, and mission sweats. And they were the thing, that was the thing that people started to show when, particularly if the chief exec executive would say to them, uh, just remind me, Matt, what, what are our values? And you could see the sweat breaking out on people's brows as they got them mixed up with the vision. They couldn't quite remember all the words. Um, so that was becoming a real problem, that what people were actually doing, how people were actually delivering, it was getting really lost. Our whole values and who we were was getting really lost because people just simply couldn't remember. The other thing that was happening for us is even when people could remember, um, people were getting quite cynical about it. So if you'd say to somebody, um, okay, then what are our values? And they'd go, oh, teamwork, continuous improvement, and customer focus. And there was absolutely no authenticity behind it. In fact, people just chuffed that they'd remember the words, but really weren't thinking about what that really meant for how we deliver our business. So there was a high degree of cynicism um, around our vision, value, and mission. 
And the other thing that we noticed is, was a lot of blindness, that we'd had them for so long that people became blind to um, became blind to what was actually actually there. So there was a real real concern that no matter how much we revamped them, did quizzes around them, etc., people were becoming very blind to what they were all about. So what we decided to do is we asked a, we asked a, a number of colleagues to go out into the business and uh, test our DNA. What, what's Bromford really about? And it was done from a range of colleagues from different uh, jobs across the business, and they came up with, with these four things. Be good, be brave, be different, and be commercial. And underpinning that was all about be your best. Um, so that's what we then adopted. So we scrapped our vision, value, and mission, and we, we adopted the Bromford DNA. But we wanted to feed this in to our learning um, programme and, and do that in quite a robust and visual way. So we invented the, um, the uh, DNA dartboard. So if you could step up to the Oki, you can, uh, all colleagues are allowed to throw their darts now at the, the, um, the DNA dartboard. And what colleagues do with this within the B. Bromford system is look at what's sitting behind that, because there's obviously a lot of description that sits behind that, and they measure themselves against how they're delivering their targets, not just against the deadlines or the, or the, the, the sort of figures, the hard figures measures, but also the, the DNA behind how they're delivering what they're, what they're learning and what they're um, achieving. And also the, the manager can do this as well, the leader can do this and they can overlay the two. And where we see a gap very often provokes a fantastic conversation and people can then go into the system and they can chart what they want to stop, start, do differently, have a conversation um, about how they're actually delivering what they're doing. So that became a very important part of, of our B. Bromford um, story. It was, became a great place for us to embed those particular, those particular um, our, our DNA, which is very particular to us. Okay, so... I want to round up now by just um, touching on the, the why we do things. I said at the beginning that we wanted this to be a real 3D approach. So it's what people are doing, um, how people are doing it, very important to us, but also why are people doing what they do? And I think um, that's when I take off my learning and development hat and put my comms hat on, um, really. So, at Bromford, we're um, quite uh, into our digital communication channels. We vlog, vlog blog, podcast, um, you name it, we, we, we'll have a digital channel, as well as all the traditional face-to-face -face channels, um, e-newsletters, e intranet, etc. So we're quite, um, just to give you a, a bit of context, we're quite savvy when it comes to digital communication. And the one thing that I really wanted to focus on that we use um, in our communications approach um, is, is Yammer. People familiar with Yammer? Yeah, people use it in their, in their business, yeah. Well, Yammer, it's a bit like a Facebook, but it's an internal Facebook. So it sits outside of our network and it's something that we've adopted as a way of having great conversations across the business. And how this fits with our learning approach is, we've done all the learning here, we've supported people with doing it with the right approach and attitude, um, but what we want people to do is tell great stories about that in practice, because no matter how much learning, development, training we do with people, unless they're delivering it in that way, um, we're not doing our jobs properly. And Yammer's been a great place for people to tell stories about the, how they're actually putting things into practice. Now, what I would say is we have no rules around Yammer. People can post whatever they like on it. The only rule we say is if you're not prepared to say it out loud in our cafe area, don't post it, because um, it's probably not a suitable thing to post. So if you're getting married, it's obviously not me, it'd be being a bridesmaid again, but if you're having a baby, if you're coming back from maternity leave, you've got a family event going on that you want to share, that's absolutely fine. But also what we get is great people telling great stories um, about what they're doing out there day in, day out. Give you a few stats around Yammer. I said we've got 1,250 colleagues. We don't make people join up to Yammer, but these were our figures probably about a week ago from when I completed the presentation. So we've got 1,107 people that have voluntarily joined Yammer. Um, of, of those, about 85 are active, and there's a definition about that, which I think is, is used the system in the last couple of weeks, I think is the definition. Um, and then the people with the most post is quite interesting. Those three are all executive directors. In fact, the middle one um, is our chief executive, Mick Kent. So they are the people that are posting most on the Yammer conversations. Um, interesting, I think Mick is going to be quite unhappy that he slipped from the top slot. So uh, I'm doing a presentation with him next week, so I bet he'll be yammering away trying to get himself uh, back up there. But how that's helped us to tell the stories um, is really phenomenal. And I, I, 
I did a presentation with someone, which I won't name the organisation because it was a very honest presentation this guy did last week at a, an event where an organisation, if I mention them, you would know they are known for having a fantastic culture. And what he said to me was he said, Helena, the thing is I'm telling you stories that I told about our culture five years ago and I should be telling you a story that brings alive our culture from yesterday and our, our, their DNA from, from yesterday. So it was a bit of a challenge for me and I thought I need to tell you some, some recent stories and not anything from our past. So I've had a mooch around on Yammer in the last couple of days and there was a story that I, I saw yesterday which was about um, some of our colleagues serving papers for an eviction. Not a great success story for us. An eviction is a complete failure in our world. We should be doing everything to make a, a tenancy work, but sadly, that happens from time to time. So our community safety manager, Lisa Brett, had been out to serve these papers for an eviction. It had been a really tricky event. Um, the uh, person receiving the papers hadn't wanted to take them, thrown them back, there'd been an altercation, and she was sharing this story on Yammer, which is great, because particularly when you work in finance and HR, you don't always get to know what re life's really like out there on the front line. So she was sharing this story on Yammer. And the, the hashtags that she put with that were be brave, be commercial um, and be good because it was an antisocial behaviour case. So she was doing something good for the other people that were suffering from this. So immediately we could see that Lisa had applied her, all the learning and development that she'd done, but she'd also applied our DNA to it in a real situation out there. Another story I saw this week was the chief executive. Um, he was posting in a response to people being following the Benefit Street programme. Um, well, you can imagine in our industry, we're watching that really uh, with, with interest because we actually work in that area and have supported people on that particular street, which is really interesting. So uh, we're watching that one like a hawk. And he put quite a controversial post on um, yesterday because one of our, our unique points as an organisation is that we are very much about helping people to be their best, about helping people to help themselves rather than a very paternal approach to being a landlord. Um, so he posted something quite uh, controversial yesterday and he hashtagged that with be your best and that was a call out to all colleagues that you're doing a great job so continue that be your best as well. Um, and then the other story I've seen over the last couple of days is, is from our innovation team. We've got an innovation coach in the business who's setting up a new innovation team um, and he put um, be different and be commercial. So again, what we could see was people who'd taken learning from our learning system, putting it into practice and then telling a story about it. And even from a comms person point of view, putting a hashtag on that we can search on it um, and, and tell those stories. So a little bit of a, a sidetrack there that I wanted to take you on, just to share with you how we've, how we've brought some of this alive in the business. Now, I did say um, that I would share with you a bit of the good, the bad and the ugly about this journey, um, because it's, it's never a smooth road, is it, as, as you well know. Well, the good is that we picked um, an organisation to work with and a product to work with. I will plug them, TWM, because we're, we're very proud of working with them on this. Um, that we were able to work with them to shape and um, create the product that we wanted to support our journey rather than drive it. And just by being a part of that, we've also joined a little gang of people that are working with them. So, you know, I'll make no... Uh, is there anybody here from Sainsbury's? Um, because the, 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 the sort of dartboard, the DNA dartboard was shamelessly pinched from something Sainsbury's were doing, but I think they've shamelessly pinched a couple of our ideas back, so we're, we're friends again, that's okay. Um, so the good is we've been able to shape it. It's not driven us, but it's, it's helped us to, to make that journey. Um, I think the other good thing is I've got a fabulous team behind me to support me in that, who've really believed in it, dared to do some really different things. They're at the back and about to wave their pom-poms in a moment, so... Uh, so yeah, but a fantastic team to support me in that. And I think the, if I was picking, perhaps I could lump together the, uh, the bad and the ugly because there isn't too much of it. I think probably we underestimated just the, what sort of resource we needed to put fantastic content into our, our new learning approach and also perhaps some of the skills that we needed to do that. So we've been trying to learn very quickly. We've brought in new skills to, to, uh, to address some of that. So I'd probably say they were the good, the good, bad and the ugly in that. And I, I guess another good for us is we are a very um, socially connected and digital business as well. So that's helped people to get usage of the system um, really high. So just to finish on that note, these are some of the stats around um, our B. Bromford learning system. Um, I won't read them out because you can read them there, but you'll see that we've got a really high take-up of the system, really high usage in a fairly short space of time. And I think it's because of a number of those elements that have, that have helped us to achieve that. So, 
that's the Bromford story. Um, I did say I put my contact details on there in case anybody was wanting to talk to me further about any of the information that I've shared with you today, or you want to book um, a disgracefully professional bridesmaid, then, uh, then uh, do give me a call and I, uh, I will follow that up with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was actually interesting, some of the comments you made tied quite well into the stats that uh, Laura shared with us earlier around engagement and uh, right. yeah. just kind of being a bit inspiring about how you give people things and the DNA particularly I think is excellent. Lovely. Great. Okay, well we've now got Lucy Ventris coming up to speak. Um, and as I've said, Lucy's looking after talent and capability for EasyJet at the moment, but um, She's had a various HR professional opportunities with FTSE 100 organisations, the Compass Group, Barclays, and I think you started with EasyJet in, as an HR generalist That's to start right, with, yeah, didn't absolutely. you? Yes, yeah. great. So Lucy's now going to tell us the EasyJet story. Okay, so um, what I wanted to do this afternoon was to share with you, we're still very early in our kind of learning and development um, strategy. Um, we're only a very young company, we're still only 18 years old, which, um, you know, we're still growing quite, uh, quite massively. So, um, ooh, that's it. so uh, before I go on, I just thought I'd just sort of share some of the stats with you. So we started with about two aircraft 18 years ago, we now got over 200. Um, we're in, I don't know how many destinations, it changes on a daily basis. So, you know, the number of routes that we, we, um, we fly just changes um, on a weekly basis. The number of airports changes almost on a monthly basis. Um, and the number of passengers that we, we sort of take from destination to destination has increased massively year on year for at least the last 15 years. So just to give you some scale in the last year, we moved from 15 million to 60 million passengers. Um, but it's not always been, been like that. When I joined the organisation about five years ago, I think we made about £20 million pounds profit. Um, last last no, October, November, when we closed our financial year, we made £478 million pounds profit. So the, the growth in five years has just been absolutely um, extraordinary. And sitting sort of there five years ago, you would never have sort of thought that, that we could have achieved that. Um, so as an organisation, we've had to do a lot of growing up and uh, put some, a lot more structure into some of the things that we do, which is, you know, at times makes us a bit uncomfortable because we want to be quite fluid, we want to move quite quickly with the times. Um, so over that time, we have grown to over 8,000 people, so that's people that are employed by EasyJet. We also have about 20,000 um, 20, ground handlers that we have. Um, we also um, outsource some of our engineering and maintenance as well. Um, so we have 8,000 people, about 4,500 of those are um, cabin crew, and they are based in about seven different locations around Europe. Um, about 2,000 of those are pilots, um, again, based all over Europe, and they are all on very different contracts of employment uh, with us. And the remaining 1,500 are what we call our management and admin population. Um, so they're pretty much based in the hangar in Luton. So we have a nice bright orange building. You can't miss us. If you're ever at Luton Airport, come and, come and uh, check out the reception area. It's very plush. Um, so it's half of a, half of a hangar. Um, so there's 1,500 people there. Um, mainly the, the sort of the corporate functions that you'd expect in a, in a big organisation. But it also includes a lot of our shift workers, which would be our operational control centre, who effectively manage the last 24 hours of flying. So they're, you know, they're pretty much employed 24-7. Um, we also have engineering and maintenance, again, working almost a 24-7 operation. So they're included in that. So that in itself presents some challenges from a people point of view. We've got people in the air who very rarely have time to do any development. They're in the building, they get their brief for the day and they're off on the aircraft. They come and they come, you know, they sort of land at the end of the day and they just want to get home at the end of the day. They don't want to hang around um, learning a bit more after standing on their feet for 10 hours. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit more later on about that in terms of our profile of our employees and, and the challenges that presents us in terms of our learning and development strategy. But we are now the biggest airline in uh, Europe and the fourth, um, no, sorry, biggest airline in the UK. It would be wonderful if I could stand here and say we're the biggest airline in Europe. Fourth biggest in Europe um, and we really are trying to fight for that number one spot in Europe. Um, but uh, over the last kind of five years we have become truly European. 
We were very much a UK-centric business um, when I joined the business five years ago. Over the last three years or so, we have become truly European. Over 50% of our passengers now originate from outside of the UK, uh, which again for us, from a people point of view, we need to think about that in terms of our learning and development strategy. So that's kind of where we are today. And our future is really about, um, I guess, having another big ambition, which is to be Europe's preferred um, short haul airline of choice. Um, you know, it's quite a bold statement, but three years ago, we never thought we'd you know, reach the profits that we had. You know, we're in the FTSE 100 now, I think, at number 60. So you know, the, the change has been uh, phenomenal, as I said before. So because that is our ambition, um, the, the top management team have spent a lot of time just really trying to set us, set us up, I guess, for the future. Um, so some of the things that we're talking about is around making travel easy and affordable for our passengers. But actually, internally, we need to think about how we can make things easy and affordable for our, for our employees. So easy in terms of their development and what can we afford as an organisation to, you know, to, to invest in them. So um, every year we set priorities. So one of the priorities for this year, as well as growing in France and in Italy, um, one of the, the sort of the priorities for the board is the, the fact that um, we need to invest in our people and um, the development and succession is actually one of those priorities. So recognised as a business, in order for us to continue to grow the way that we're growing, we need to invest in our people. When I joined five years ago, they had just stripped away the learning and development department, as most organisations do when they're going through a bit of a tricky time. Um, so for the last 18 months since I've been in the role, myself and three others, so you talk about your team, for, for, our, for us at EasyJet, we are so, so lean. It's me, my boss, and uh, somebody else who looks after the, the actual site. Um, but we actually then run the learning development function. So between the three or four of us, um, you know, we've got quite a lot of pressure in terms of this priority of succession and development. Come on in. That's all right. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, you know, in order to reach the ambition, people are really important. Our competitors are really trying to keep up with us in terms of the product. And, you know, you look at sort of British Airways and what they're trying to do. Um, the price as well, lots of, um, of our competitors are now sort of advertising low-cost fares on their, their advertisements and so on. Um, but we really see that people are, are going to be our differentiator in the future. So trying to keep an engaged workforce who work very, very hard. We've got pilots who come into the industry who, you know, they, they come in, they sit in a cockpit with, you know, people that they don't necessarily know. They're flying with different people every day. They're going to do that for 40, 50 years. To keep those people engaged is quite a tricky task for, for us um, as a business. Equally, we've got, you know, got a nice smiley cabin crew here, but the stuff that they have to face every day um, is quite, you know, it's quite difficult stuff. I rate passengers, just the fact that you are flying in the air, you know, and what that does to your health and well-being and that kind of thing. So in terms of a development point of view, that's something we need to think about. So that kind of leads me into how we've come up with our, our learning philosophy. So you know, we've got these people out and about, we've got people on shifts who never really actually have time. They want to be developed, but as a business, we are low cost. We want to manage our costs. So we are trying to look at ways in which we can give them the development that they need, but in our low cost way. And actually, some pilots want to be developed. Others are quite happy earning a good salary and financing stuff outside of the organisation. Um, but others do want to become pilot managers. They do want to run a base. Um, equally with our cabin crew as well. But thinking about the numbers, 4,500, we've probably got about 50 managers. So, you know, if we had 4,500 people trying to take the 50 manager spots, it's, it's quite a challenge for us in terms of trying to develop them. So we thought about long and hard, and we thought actually 70% um, of the learning that people do uh, is on the job at EasyJet. So the 70-20-10 philosophy really works for us very well. We are very lean, as I mentioned before. So the kind of the 20%, the re we're a very relationship-driven business. So a lot of um, how we get things done is because of who you know in the organisation. Um, so, so that really works for us as well. And we have 10% um, formal learning. So every year, our cabin crew and our pilots, they go through a lot of mandatory regulatory training that you'd expect of, of an airline. Um, but none of that is really development. So. Um, we've had some quite good wins over the last um, year or so. We've been able to schedule pilots off for an extra day of development a year, which you know is a big cost to, to an organisation when you're talking about 2,000 um, 
2,000 pilots. Um, so that's worked really well. We've had some really good feedback on that. Um, and we are about self-directed learning. So, you know, it, it's pretty much impossible when you've got 4,500 um, cabin crew out there um, to actually know exactly what each of them um, do. They don't get time with their manager. You know, one manager at base may see their person twice a year because of the volume of people that are based there. So self-directed learning really works for us. We'll show them where to go for stuff and they have to go get it. And that's really what EasyJet's about. Um, and we offer blended learning solutions. So I'll come on to that in, in a moment um, in terms of kind of our offering and, and what we decided to do there. Um, but we like to think that people can just pick and choose at the time that's you know, available for them, um, whether they're at home or whether they're in the crew room or at the desk if they're M&A. So um, one of the ways that we thought we could achieve the 70-20 philosophy was to um, put some investment into... Uh, put some investment into um, a learning te technology solutions. So we went out and, um, and, and did an RFP and we went through quite um, a process um, to, to find out uh, a supplier that we could work with. So when we went out there, we were looking for somebody that could really fit with, I guess, offering us a financially savvy, um, I guess, uh, cost model. Uh, because, you know, we are low cost after all. Um, and in terms of the growth of the organisation, we need to make sure that we can manage those costs going forward. Um, we needed a, a business that could work with the growth. So that's 60 there that you see in orange t-shirts. That's just really just emphasizing the growth of the organization. Um, we also needed a solution that would work well with the values of EasyJet and our strategy. So up there on the right hand corner, that's our, our, what we call our strategic pyramid. So it needed to fit in with that. And obviously our brand is really, really strong. So when we went out, we really wanted to make sure that the, the, the um, the solution looked like an EasyJet product. We didn't want just some off-the-shelf. We did want an off-the-shelf product, but we wanted it to be tailored to look like um, EasyJet. Um, you know, our, our website is, is second to none. It's the, the leading travel website in, in the world. Um, so anything internally, people expect us to have top-notch technology. Um, and the final one was really, it needed to be able to support seven different locations across Europe um, as well. So that was really important. So we went through a long process and we selected um, City and Guilds Kineo and Rory, our account manager, is here today. Um, and we've worked really, really closely with them in very, what seemed like actually a really short space of time to actually from actually selecting the supplier. Well, for, it, we selected it quite a way back, but when we actually got the money signed off, it was kind of two and a half, three months to actually get the solution delivered to market. So quite an aggressive timeline, but it worked really well. Um, so some of the other challenges that we faced that we wanted to um, try and, I guess, um, achieve from our learning um, technology solution was the fact that, you know, we do have 8,500 people out there. We have no idea of... How we, we had no idea of what training they were doing, apart from the mandatory training, what learning. There was no record of it anywhere. So it was really, really important for us to be able to track people's learning. Um, and then we could actually measure the return on investment. We did, do, we did um, invest in some external courses, but you know, people's names were written on spreadsheets, people left. You know, there was no central record that we had. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we could track our return on investment. We've also done a lot of work with our managers the last couple of years. We've just launched a management development programme that's going really well that every single line manager will go through. Um, you know, before that, we were growing so quickly. Technical managers were just pushed into people manager roles with no people manager experience at all. So you talk to them about development, and they're like, well, I don't know, we're low cost. We don't have any development at EasyJet. So we really tried through the system to give them some support they get um, acknowledgements when their team are, are going out and, and um, going to workshops if they're undertaking any learning so that they can then actually pick up with those individuals after and say, how was it? How did it fit with your role? What are you going to do differently? Um, so there was never really that information before. Um, and we wanted to, it was quite a controversial decision, but typically people um, align their development to competencies. But we made a, a, a decision to align our um, development to our values of the organisation around simplicity, around safety, around being pioneering. So we've got a, a set number of values and we align all of our um, technology around that. 
Um, and the other thing is that we, um, we have various different platforms uh, at EasyJet uh, for different learning management systems. So we were running some mandatory training off um, just a, a single platform. Um, a department went out and just did that on their own. Uh, we had also our legal team who'd gone out and done some ethics and bribery um, uh, e-learning that they'd got sourced. So we had all these different departments doing various different bits of e-learning. There, no, there was nothing joined up. So the platform has enabled us, I guess, to try and put all of that together. Um, and in the long term, we do, we do see that we have just one learning platform across um, EasyJet. So um, in terms of our, our offering, um, we went out and did some research. We spoke to some of Kineo's other clients like Tesco um, and talked to them about kind of what worked, um, what works for them, what, what are they getting their best bang for their buck, um, as it were. Um, and so some of the things they talked to us about was that actually less is more. You know, there's no point putting thousands and thousands of um, e-learning modules on there or thousands and thousands of articles. People just won't read them. And then reflecting on the kind of population that we have, they're not going to have time to trawl through a thousand. We need to keep it short and sweet. So um, we, we did a lot of research ourselves. We sourced all of our own articles, all of our own videos that we've got on there, YouTube clips and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, the e-learning modules, we put about three on there to start with. And to be honest, people really prefer the videos and the articles and the top tips and things like that, um, which for me was quite a, an eye-opener. Um, our offering also includes, as I mentioned before, our mandatory training. So it's for our management and admin population. So there's one place. If you're a new starter, you can just go to one place now rather than having 10 different passwords to go and do all your mandatory training. It's all in one place, which worked really, really well. And Kineo helped us in terms of the look of the field to make sure that it did seem quite a seamless process. Um, and we've been able to put together some programs. So I mentioned a moment ago about our new management development program. So that is run off our, our system in terms of all the support materials, you know, all the booking, booking yourself on it and all of that kind of thing. And also we've just started to use something called communities where cohorts of managers can go onto the site and they can talk about experiences with each other just for their particular cohort. It's not opened up to the rest of the organisation and that's worked really well for us as well and something we want to explore later on um, down the line. Um, we've also got some things for our inductees. Our induction process was quite fragmented around the organisation. Pilots were doing their thing, cabin crew were doing their thing, M&A were doing their thing. And now we have some central um, resource where we've got you know, standard, consistent information that affects everybody is in one place. And we've just developed some e-learning modules that go live in about two weeks um, with Kineo. Um, but we've really tried to use the system to, um, I guess, make sure that all the documents are in one place and make it easy for everybody. So um, these whizzy slides um, just give you an indication of some, kind of some of the stuff that we've been doing. So we've talk, thought about our shift workers and we run a, a very successful career development workshop. Probably 500 of our M&A employees have been through this in the last few years. We wanted to open that up to our um, shift workers, so we created some quite basic PowerPoints um, and put some voiceover on them and broke it down into three or four modules, and we've got that on the site, and that has gone down really well with our shift workers because they feel like they're not missing out on some of the face-to-face -face courses. It's quite interactive because we get them to do um, quite a few exercises and questionnaires, and they have to use that, do that before they can actually do the modules. So that's worked really well for, for us. Um, as I mentioned before, we've moved all of our compliance um, training over there um, onto the site as well. Um, but one of the things that we really wanted to, to try and drive was this is a development site. It wasn't just about the mandatory training. Um, there was no development before. So, you know, we, we don't want necessarily all the technical training to be on the site. It's just some of the mandatory stuff to go, to go on there. Um, so... The results in terms of kind of, we're really, really proud of what we've been able to achieve. We launched to the M&A community, so that's the 1,500 last May. Um, and uh, consistently now, we've got 35% of that 1,500 using the site on a monthly basis. I personally I was expecting about 10, 15% when we sort of set out doing this. So we're really, really pleased with the 35%. And the majority of those people are our shift workers. So that has gone down really, really well for them. 
Um, for our pilots, we were overwhelmed with the number of pilots using the site. They can sometimes be quite cynical um, about some of this kind of stuff. Um, so 25% um, of our pilots are consistently using the site on a monthly basis. So um, there's something going right there. And we've gone out and we've spoken to them about what it is. And they just really like the content. Um, and I'll come on to some of our successes in a moment, but um, I think we've got some really relevant material um, on there now that drives them to the site and then they go and have a look around and see what else there is to offer. Um, for our engineers, um, there's 15%. Uh, so again, engineers are very much like pilots. They come in, they're really going to do the same job for, for the rest of their career. So 15% of our um, engineers who do tend to be... Um, I guess, uh, an older demographic than a lot of the other areas in the department um, at EasyJet. So, you know, 15% for that population for us is really, really good. And 5% of our cabin crew, which seems quite low, but when you're talking about 4,500 people, um, probably about 1,000 of those are fixed-term people, so they're not going to be at EasyJet. They just come in for the summer and then they go. So, you know, for us, 5% was really, um, you know, really actually quite rewarding. Um, and when we went live with our pilots and cabin crew in September time, so we gave it a bit of breathing space, we got the M&A up and running and then we moved over to our um, cabin crew and our pilots. We, were, um, we had something on there called a career development plan, which none of our manage, uh, manager and admin communities had, had used at all. We hadn't had any questions around that. Um, but when our pilots went on there, we were overwhelmed with the number. Within the first two days, 500 pilots had actually gone on and created themselves a career development plan. They'd never had any tools to do that before. Um, so that's been really, really successful. Um, we've done some en enhancements with Kineo over um, time as well. So we have um, put some ratings now on. So like you go on and you rate your Amazon product or whatever the cases and you know, all that kind of stuff now uh, we've got that with our courses so if you go on a face-to-face -face course you can come off and you can rate it and then that gives people a really good um, you know indication whether it's a worthwhile course going on uh, likewise with some of our um, articles as well um, and it's really started to drive our development offering so I mentioned before about more is less so we're not we don't keep adding to it. If we add to it, we take stuff off. So we've got articles that have never been read. So on a kind of every two months now, we're looking at the top 10, bottom 10 articles. So we'll take off those and then we'll replace them with something else. Um, so it is really driving our, our development offering. Um, and we've got a lot more engagement from other parts of the organisation like Ops Risk, which we never thought would be engaged in this, um, this system. They've come to us and said, we want to put all our material on there. We want to open it up to everyone at EasyJet. So it's really opening doors for people to find out different um, things about other departments as well. So we found it a bit of, a, I guess, a communication tool as well. So um, I just thought I'd highlight um, in our journey kind of what we feel are some of the successes that has made it successful, because we do believe that um, it has been successful. So the first one is really communication and engagement. So throughout the process, when we were loading content and sourcing content, we went out and spoke to different communities. So as I said before, each of them have got really different interests. Pilots, quite intellectual bunch. Cabin crew, you know, quite early on in their career. M&A, um, VAS, you know, you've got accountants through to um, people in marketing. So, you know, we went out and we spoke to each of the different departments and said, what sort of thing would you be interested in? And we sourced um, the material. Most of it is free material, it's stuff off the internet that anyone can, anyone can find. Um, but we've made it easy for them by putting it in one place. Um, so engagement was key and communication as well. So we've, when we launched, we did kind of a, a road show. So we, in our... Um, lovely orange canteen we did um, some stalls and we talked about things we had some of our suppliers come in and talk about the the, the training that they do and, and things like that so that went down really well um, and when we launched to our um, cabin crew and pilots in September we purposely did quite a soft launch so we literally sent them an email um, and in their base newsletters they had a paragraph on it um, but since January we've started to go out to all of the different bases and actually showcase it now um, and actually help them out where they've been a bit stuck they're not sure where to find things and things like that. Um, this is Carolyn McCall our uh, chief exec so she's been really um, 
engaged in it, as have all of our airline management boards. So um, she mentioned it on her, she has like a weekly podcast, a weekly call. Um, so when we launch to each of the different populations, she would mention it. Um, when we talk about performance management, she'll refer, uh, she talks about that when we're going through the annual cycle, she refers to, to the site as well. So that's been really, really positive for us. Um, and I've been in many meetings now with some of the board where they'll go, someone will talk about development, they'll say, have you been on the online de learning academy? Because that's what we call it. Um, you know, there's some really great stuff on there. So they're, they're really actually promoting it for us as well. Um, and we've been listening to what people wanted. So there were some solutions like people wanted language courses, something we've never... Um, we've never offered before. So we've, we've gone out and we've sourced some language courses at a relatively um, good price, and we've now put those on there. Um, we've also um, put things on there, like we have a really great resilience workshop, which is a face-to-face -face that has some people wanted more information on that. So we've, we've put that on there as well. And we're just continually listening to the feedback. So you know, people had some issues with their passwords resetting. So we've gone back to Kenya and said, this is a problem. It's not making it easy for our people if they forget their password. We've come up with a solution for that now. We've made the passwords a little bit more easier. So that's taken some development work. But that's, you know, that's been really, really good for us. Um, so we continue listening to the feedback. Some of the stuff that we've found quite a challenge, we've got a very dated HR system, uh, which is in the process of being upgraded. So by the end of the year, we'll be in a much better space. Um, but the data um, was really quite messy in terms of reporting lines and job titles, you know, some being lowercase, some being uppercase. It just didn't make it easy in terms of transitioning data onto the site. Um, so we had to do a big cleansing exercise um, on that. Um, so that proved a challenge for us and it took up a lot more time than we expected. Um, also, because of our HR system, we can't just do an auto sync. So we're having to do like a manual upload on a weekly basis because we do have quite a number of people start, um, joining us on a weekly basis. So um, we're now talking to Kinio and with our, our new system provider, HR system provider about how we can link that up when, um, when, we, uh, when we go live later on in the year. That will save us a hell of a lot of time. Um, and one thing that took up a lot of time for me was building hierarchies. It's quite a complex organisation. It's a simple organisation, but it's actually complex as well. So you've got pilots who are flying planes, but they're also management, but they fly because they have to continue their flying. So you've got them sitting in two different cost centres. So trying to work out in the hierarchy, where do you put them and all of that kind of thing, was a bit of a headache that we just didn't anticipate. Uh, and again, took up a lot of time. Um, and given the timescales we were working to, we really did underestimate the resources that we needed to do this. So we brought somebody in for a fixed period of time, which was absolute godsend, but we managed to make the savings somewhere else in our budget. Uh, but she helped you know, source the content and um, load it all up as well. So that was really, really beneficial for us. So, um, finally, really, um, next steps. We are continuing on the journey. As I said, we're really the only... So last May, we launched our um, online learning academy. Our learning and development function is still only 18 months old, so it's still very new and fresh. We don't want to do anything more radical. We've got a lot of stuff going on now that we just want to embed into the organisation, get some rhythm around it, um, is what we call it, um, and try and just build it into the fabric of EasyJet so that people are using the site a little bit more. Um, we want to develop our mobile capability, so we're not using mobile as best we can at the moment. Um, you know, we've got some, we've got a brilliant new EasyJet app that we use. So, if you're a customer of EasyJet, go and download it if you haven't got it already. But um, a really brilliant app. We do some all this great stuff. So we want to bring that to our people as well. Um, so we've, uh, we've got some stuff in the pipeline with Kinio um, later on in the year to, uh, to, to, to look at that. Um, and then, as I mentioned already as well, in the integration with our new HR system, it's going to give us a bit of time back in terms of keeping the records up to date and that kind of thing. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you. Shall I come sit there? <laughs> okay, two very interesting stories, particularly interested in the the connection between both of you using your values almost as a sort of, uh, I'll take your word DNA, but something that you went back to, to try and build on and, and give people some context really around the learning. So that was really interesting. I was also interested that, um, not, not underestimating the resources seems to always come up in these conversations. And uh, 
I think that's uh, something probably resonates a lot with the people out here. So what questions have you got for Helena and Lucy? Yeah? Do a, try shouting loudly and we'll see how you go. Oh yeah, she's on her way. <laughs> <laughs> the, the trouble of asking what the rates are for the bridesmaids, so it's because you didn't actually, <laughs> there was no declaration. Of drinks. Shame, shame <laughs> uh, simply, I mean, I think what I heard from that most clearly, apart from DNA and values, I, I, it was all about partnerships with your mm. providers, and I could sense there's a real sense of attachment there, which is not always the case. Mm. And I was just wondering whether the reasons, if you like, you decided to go with these providers actually with hindsight still apply because I can imagine that you went in with things like price performance retention all that stuff but what came out really was well, it was listening which Lucy mentioned too you know feedback listening I just get the sense that you probably appreciated different qualities from those that you actually bought into originally yeah. do you want to go first yeah, I, I think that um you know, whether it's a partnership to do with a learning provider or in anything in business now, it, it, it is very much a, a, a rather than a client customer relationship, it is very much a partnership. And we um, went very much into it with um, what club is that going to give us access to, as well as all the things that you've mentioned about, you know, price, performance, and, and quality track record, and all of those things that you check out. What club does that give us access to that we can learn from and we're prepared to give to as well? So I think that's, that's part of the partnership. And we, we, we are in this for, for the long haul. And, and I think, particularly with technology, you, you, could, you could shift every five minutes and see a whizzy bit on somebody else's kit, you know, all, all the time. But I think we, you, we're in this for the long haul. So it's about someone you genuinely can identify um, that you think you can work with mm -hmm. in, in the long haul to achieve the games. And I think that the other thing is, is about a partnership is we're quite happy to share our ideas and I guess our intellectual property, knowing that that supplier might repackage some of that work with another client to sell it on. And we're fine with that because we get just as much back. So I think it's a genuine partnership, I would say, with TWM that we've worked with. That's been our, our approach. It's about a genuine partnership and give and take and bartering and um, you know, being real. I think similarly for, for us as well, you know, we wanted to make sure, you know, we could have bought all whistles of the stuff when we first started, but, you know, and a lot of suppliers were trying to sell us all this other stuff. And it's like, actually, we just need the basics for now. We're going to work as a partnership and we will build and you just need to trust us that it's going to take time. So, um, and I think we've, we've probably proved that over the last kind of um, 12 months or so. We, you know, we are looking at our product. We're looking at how we can enhance it, but we didn't want to go all, you know, all bells and all whistles straight away. So it was trying to find a provider who was quite comfortable with that and actually sees that this is a partnership for the long term as we evolve as an organisation and, and we reinvest our, our profits into to learning and development, so, same. <coughs> Great question, thank you. Any other questions? Yep, we've got a couple more here. This question for Lucy. Mm -hmm. On the integration to the HR system, obviously that's hardware systems, did you also integrate it into performance management? Um, so that's something we haven't made a decision at the moment. Our performance management system is very paper-based, so we've got, we've got a call to make, actually, because in the new HR system, there's a performance management system, but equally in the Tatara um, we're, that we um, have on our system, there's an upgrade next year where we can do that. So, so we don't do it at the moment, but the plan is that by the end of the year, we will look to, to integrate performance management into to one or the other system. Yeah. Great. This one up there. You both talked about rollout programs and both described them as being phased. Was the phasing of it a, a, a tactical resource-based issue or did you have a set of criteria that you used in terms of the phasing and, the, and how did you identify the, how you'd stage it and, and the early adopters? Um, so with us, we, we always knew we'd have a phased approach because you just never, you're never sure when you <laughs> put new technology in how it's going to go or whether things need to be tweaked. So the safest thing for us was to do it with the, the people that were, you know, that could come up to us at the desk. So the people in our hangar. So that was one and a half thousand management and admin population. Um, and then we just tactically, we, we wanted to get it out before our summer period. So, 
you know, May wasn't a great time because all the cabin crew and pilots are in training, ready for, for getting ready for the summer. So we didn't want to launch this in the busy period, which they're going to say, you're working us really hard. We've got no time to actually look at this site. You're trying to push it to us. So we tactically said, right, when we're coming out of summer into September, that's when we'll launch. And then now we're in our winter period, which tends to be a bit quieter. That's why now we're doing the road shows, because they've got more time if we go and stand in a base to come and talk to us. Um, so for us, it was very tactical. Um, and we got, got some good learnings as well. We started with the rollout of the performance element first. And the reason for that was we were um, trying to get a, the performance element to work within our existing HR system, and it was really clunky. And what was happening was people liked the um, process that we were doing, but the software that we were using to do it was so clunky that people were just crying out for new software to, to work with. So we were pushing against an open door on the performance management bit. Um, so that was our starting point. And then because it's all in one place, people got really used to using B. Bromford, um, with, with the wee badger as. And, and um, so when we came to, to roll out the learning parts of it, people were already kind of using the system, familiar with the navigation. And what we did is we did um, a series of, everybody in the team kind of, it was a divide and conquer, and went out to various team meetings to do lots and lots of mini demos of how to use the system. And particularly with things like our engineers who really struggle with um, some of the IT um, that we have, really sort of, um, you know, no question too obvious workshops where we could go along and support them on how to use the system. And because we get great stats off it, we know who's using it, who, what parts they're using, who's not using it, so we can then continue that journey of going out to support people to use it and use it effectively. So a real kind of phased rollout as well for us. And I may have missed it because I was 15 minutes late, but do either of you have any um, like structure around capability frameworks in place? So um, we have our competency framework, and that's really what we call our, our capability framework. So same sort of thing. So um, that's something that we haven't brought into the development site purely because we wanted that to be about people's, I guess, development against the values of EasyJet. But we do have a, a competency framework. I'm happy to talk to you about that after and give you a demo I've got my laptop as is really contained within the job ready pathway and then the DNA that underpins that as well so that's how we would measure measure that good great questions any more time for one more well thank you ladies for really an entertaining session and really interesting hearing about what's going on in your worlds and the challenges you've had and also the successes, so it's always nice to hear when things are working. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks.